So uh, today we will study the research action which has been done here in SAS. And as you may remember, one of the objectives of this course is also to give you a little inkling of what is the research uh, we are doing here and how it is done. Okay? And um, actually I will base a big part of this talk on recent publications we have made, and if you want to read things tranquilly and in detail, you can find these articles here on, on the internet easily, uh, and you can also, as you know, come and see me uh, for, for further questions uh, on, on this matter. So, the, the human model of consciousness and free will, okay, we call it the CMT model, and I will explain you why exactly uh, we call it uh, that way. Um, we will later on make the link with other existing theories, um, but that's for a, a next uh, lecture. So one of the main ideas of you know the research we have been doing here is simply that we all use the words consciousness and free will, just as we use the word car, car and uh, evening. But you know these concepts, if you think about it, they they are very complex. That's a, one of the conclusions we came uh, to. There are a lot of a frightening number of implicit ideas linked uh, to this idea. And as you know, one of the, the tasks of philosophy is to make these implicit notions explicit. And one of the ways, as I said in the, in the preceding lecture, to start thinking about this is, for instance, to, <clears throat> to think about the question can a very young child choose freely? Can a very young child be conscious? Well, if it is a, a newborn child, then we hesitate. I think that most of us would hesitate to say that it can be that it is conscious and that it can choose freely. When it grows up, I would think that, you know, slowly but certainly uh, the, the capacity to choose freely and to become conscious grows. And these two capacities seem to evolve actually in parallel, right? I think that many people would agree that there seems to be a, uh, a connection between free will and consciousness. They seem uh, to go hand in hand. When you get older, you, you develop a sense of, of um, you know, having free will, if such a thing exists. But here in human, we think that at, at least it uh, makes sense to keep this conscious for pragmatical uh, reasons. And at the same time, when you uh, get older, uh, well, a newborn child, or let's say a fetus, fetus would probably not count as conscious, right? But we can be conscious from time to time. So in the intermediate time slot, there must be a moment where consciousness uh, uh, arises. And most people, at least we hear in, in our research, group, we think that this uh, that this goes in parallel, or this goes in parallel with the development of the brain, okay, and with the cognitive capacities. So the general, for, for those who are interested in analytic philosophy, the general approach used was to uh, construct a minimal model, in the sense that we aim to identify the minimal set of necessary and sufficient conditions to term an act free or conscious. That's a detail. Uh, and usually, at least that's how I conceive doing uh, research in, in philosophy, is that, well, an important thing is, yes, it's fun to, to think by yourself, but it's equally important, Sophia, to do what? Kazarnovi, Sophia? It's equal, may, maybe could come a little bit more to the front. It's equally important to, to, to read, of course, what all the uh, you know, scholars have, have said. You cannot suddenly appear on the scene and say, well, what all these other people have been doing since the last 2,000 years does not count. Here's how it really is. That's not very convincing. Uh, but what you can do once you have had the impression that you have read <coughs> a sufficient or a considerable amount of, of theories that exist, then you can uh, try to, for instance, make a synthesis I think that just as in natural science the, uh, you know, the, the growl of developing new theories is usually trying to synthesize um, existing theories. If you want to ask questions about that, don't hesitate. 
And once you have, you have uh, you know, produced your model, then, uh, well, I will come back to that stage in a moment. Uh, the, the literature which we use most are the, the models, theories on free will and consciousness that had the biggest impact on our work were those of Ayer and especially uh, Manner and Bunge. They wrote a book called Foundations of Biophilosophy where they also developed a whole theory on mind, consciousness and free will. Uh, a short word on, the, on some of the background assumptions. And I think that it will not come as a surprise to you that here in this interdisciplinary research group we assume that our mental activity, our thoughts, choices, feelings, and so on, have a neurological or neural basis in the brain. In other words, mental states correspond to neural networks or even super networks, and mental acts are, in other words, brain processes. So I've drawn here a few, or I've reproduced here a few of, you know, the uh, of drawings of neurons. I think you have a basic knowledge of neurons and those who will study neurobiology will, will have to develop the knowledge further. We can re really remain on the surface. We know that there are some entities in the brain which are connected, that you know when we have a feeling, when we have a thought, when we sense something, some of these networks okay, begin to, to be active. And in this case, active means that there are um, electrons running between them, there are electronic or electrical signals between them. And very many things remain here a mystery. Okay. So that this is a, a very young science, um, neurobiology. There still remains a lot of things to be done. So this is something that maybe uh, some of you will contribute to later. That would be fabulous and then we should stay in contact to see how we can link all this to philosophical co concepts such as free will and consciousness. But let us, let us be clear, there is no definite answer in neurobiology what consciousness would be. There are many theories on the market, but the debate is, is heated and uh, no one has a final answer. These are a few drawings here of, of different types of neurons. There are very many types of them. Some are specialized, for instance, in motor activity. For instance, there are neurons in the brain which know how to command my, my arm when I do this. And then there are the neurons in the prefrontal cortex, which are usually believed to be those where intelligence and, and high-level thinking are situated. Does someone know what is the difference between what is the key difference between these neurons and those that are, for instance, responsible for motor action or sensing? Anyone has an idea what is the big difference here? Sophia, you have an idea? Um, Maybe they are just in different regions of the brain. That's one thing, that's one thing. And the other thing is that those in the uh, prefrontal cortex, at least those that are responsible for learning, uh, they, are, they are plastic, they are so-called plastic neurons, meaning actually they can reconfigure themselves. They can make new connections and as will not be a surprise to you that that's exactly where learning comes in or that's how learning is possible. Okay? Learning something new is creating new neural circuits uh, in your brain. Okay. So I will immediately give you what, what we took as a basis for our work. That's here this model by uh, Mahler and Bunge. And Ayer, if you like, that's essentially a work done by um, Mario Bunge and Martin Mahner. And they say the following, I think I've already shown you this part uh, at another occasion, that, well, an action, a certain action by an animal, let's restrict the animals to the human beings, is free-willed or made by the, the person's own free will, even only if, First of all, there are two conditions. 
the action should be unconstrained, meaning that there is no third person, uh, you know, forcing you to do the act A, and there is also no programmed or external compulsion, but that's a detail, we can forget about that. And the main condition for us here is the condition that says, well, every free act is also, should also be conscious. Okay? That is a definition we assume. The reasons we have for assuming that are explained in the articles, that's, uh, you know, not something I can deal with uh, today. The reason is that, you know, this model can solve in a synthetic way problems of comparable accounts of free will and consciousness. Okay? But we do that in another course and not here today. I ask you to, uh, to, to believe me. And obviously, this is one of the, the, the many models that exist. You may have your own ideas of what is uh, free will and consciousness, obviously. So the second here condition here says that an act is conscious if it is monitored by some other mental activity in the brain of B. And we will see what exactly that means. Okay, so that's a key concept of, uh, of today. An action is conscious if it is monitored. And monitored, according to Mahler and Bunge, should be conceived in the following way. So that can mean record. For instance, you feel something and you think about it. Okay, basically, in simple words, this second condition says that you're conscious of something if you think about it. Okay, it's a little bit broader than that, but you may, uh, you know, remember it in this way. So, for instance, you, you, you feel something, and sometimes many things that you feel, for instance, we all are sensing now the temperature of this room, but we are most of the time not conscious of it, only if suddenly the temperature would drop or increase uh, with, a, with a big amount, then we would say, hey, the temperature is strange, and then we would uh, monitor the sensation. In other words, we would become conscious of it according to this model. So, a motto, an action is monitored, can mean recorded, can also mean analyzed, when there are cognitive schemes trying to understand what's happening, controlled or kept track of. Okay? Well, I will explain this in a, in a little moment, uh, a little bit better. But let us first read uh, a few excerpts of the book by Mahler and Bunge, because they, they propose a truly interesting theory on uh, what is the mind, what are mind-body interactions, what is consciousness, what is the self, and so on. Um, I had the chance to meet Mario Bunge in Montreal when I was doing my PhD uh, there. I was at the uh, Université de Montréal. Mario uh, was at McGill, which is in the same city, Montreal. Um, I, I arrived in Montreal just a few weeks, and people in my university said, we should go and meet Mario. You might share common interests. And I consider it a chance to, to have uh, met him. He is one of the most prolific philosophers uh, and writers I've, I've, I know. He wrote about he wrote more than 60 books. So every year of his, let's say, post-PhD, he wrote a book. Unfortunately, he died uh, last year. That's a big loss, according to me. But that's also life. And let us... Just for, you know, uh, for triggering your curiosity, let us uh, see what he says about the mind, okay? What is the mind, according to? And that's, at first sight, pretty counterintuitive what uh, is written in, in this book, Foundations of Biophilosophy. Uh, he says the following. <coughs> let B, you know, the plastic neuronal supersystem of a certain hum human being, or even you could think of a primate, in general, animal B, certain species A, then the mind of this human being during a certain period, Pau, is the union of all the mental processes which are actually corresponding to specific function, functions by S, that components of P, namely plastic neural systems and engaging during uh, that period. More precisely, you can write a little uh, formula here. The mind of the animal be during the, top, the, the, the period tau is the union of all the uh, mental processes or of all the, the mental functions that this animal is doing uh, during this period. 
also, as I'm, I'm very so sure that many philosophers of mind would not agree with this definition, we say no, I consider uh, mind a different thing. Because what is what is actually the key incre or let's say the key um, characteristic of this definition? Is the mind here, according to this definition, a thing? A thing. So, uh, in which uh, sense do you mean a thing like something that exists or something like a phys phys physical thing? Very good question. That's a, that's totally an appropriate question because you also have non-physical things. You're right. So I meant in a physical sense, yeah. Is, it, is, it, is the mind a physical thing according to this definition? Well, I mean, yeah, because we can uh, quantify, uh, we can quantify consciousness in the sense that if we don't have some, let's say, some brain regions or some neurostructures in our brains, then we don't really have some properties of our consciousness in a way. So. Yeah, if we consider that plasticity is a part of our nervous system and it, it is uh, undoubtedly linked to consciousness, then yes, it's a, it's a physical phenomenon. Does anyone agree? I, I get your point and I would say that's 80% the correct answer, but if you look here at the details, what do you think, Sophia? Yes, you're Sophia, right? Mm -hmm. Can someone please give a mic to Sophia? When you read it like that, as this formula, that the mind is the union, so the set, the collection, you know, union, that just a, or set is an object from logic, and so Mario says, uh, consider the set of all the mental processes of that animal during a certain time. Is a set a physical object? I actually don't know what to say exactly because um, for me it's difficult to imagine that the mind is just those small connections and a new um, and the electricity in a way these uh, uh, electronical connections that are created in our mind that are able to create some kind of thoughts that maybe never appeared in my mind before so I'm still kind of um, I want to believe that this is just what it is but something makes me feel that there should be something else should be something more should be put rather than just plain connections well that's a, that's an interesting thought and and once more I will certainly not pretend here that we are going to, to give the ultimate answers about what is consciousness and the mind. Uh, but it's not really an, an answer to my question. Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe, because here is the, the answer is either yes or no, right? Is the mind, as defined here, a physical object, a thing, or, or, or something else? I agree with, with uh, Arseny that, well, at least it emerges from a uh, material thing, because as I said, he said, if there would not be these neurons, well then, if, if you take away all the neurons of, of your brain, then uh, every biologist would say, then it will, you will not think much more anymore, and you will also not be conscious of anything uh, anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, Roman, I saw you uh, nodding uh, in agreement with Sofia. Do you want to add something or just say, yes, yeah, Sofia, this, this is... Uh, I would say that uh, mind cannot exist without this physical brain, of course, like the brain is, is a substratum, but we also cannot reduce mind to brain. There is still some gap between those two uh, things. Mm -hmm. They're like both, uh, they're two sides of something else. Interesting point. And, and partially this definition here already agrees with it because to answer the question I asked, no, according to this definition, the mind is not a physical object. It's not just a brain. The mind is a, is a conceptual object, an abstract thing. Okay, it is a set. A set is a very abstract uh, 
construction of, of human intellect. So you can call this a conceptual object. Okay? The mind is a conceptual object. We speak of it, especially uh, in the time of Descartes. As you know, René Descartes is one of those who began to, uh, to, to discuss the concept of mind most in, in detail in the history of philosophy. He was one of the first. And who remembers what is uh, Descartes' idea about the mind? What is, according to Descartes, the mind? Sophia. Yeah, can we have a... Excuse me. Here is one more. Are you stand? Stand up, please. Here is one more. <laughs> I don't remember whether, according to Descartes, uh, mind is physical object or not. Well, because uh, according to him, um, mind is something that generates uh, the process of thinking, and the, the process of thinking about mind, therefore, it's difficult to um, um, identify whether it is, it is something physical, whether it is a thing or not. Anyone wants to add something to that? In the history of philosophy, people usually remember that, you know, um, Descartes is the father of so-called substance dualism, saying that the mind is a substance, the mind is a thing, just as the human body is a thing, is a physical object. Okay? And, and this launched a huge debate among all the great philosophers of uh, those times until today, how then, if there are two substances, how do they interact? How can the mind, for instance, uh, govern uh, the body? If there, are, if they really are two objects, some people who disagree with Descartes, they would say, well, then there would be some action of the mind on the body, but then uh, the body would, due to action equals reaction, would also influence the mind and. Uh, we, we do not feel this kind of you know, interaction of forces between mind and body. So those who disagree with Descartes said, well, there is no uh, mind-body dualism. The mind is not a, a substance, the mind is not a thing. And this is what uh, corresponds here to uh, Mario Bunge's definition. The mind is a mental object, an abstract construction of the mind. Okay? You can think about it what you, what you want, that's not important for this uh, course, but it, it is interesting that you know this simple definition actually solves a whole bunch of problems of the philosophy of mind. For instance, it shows you that uh, there is no no mind-body dualism. It is not the case that the mind is a substance, and therefore actually there is also no problem how they can interact because both body and mind are, or at least matter and mind are two. Uh, conceptual object. In the words of, of those two authors, there can be no mind-matter interaction because unlike individual mental processes and brains, so individual working neurons of course are physical objects and brains are physical objects too, but mind as a concept and matter are sets, are unions, collections of conceptual objects or they are themselves conceptual objects. However, it does make sense to speak of mental bodily interactions, provided this expression is, to, is taken to abbreviate interactions among plastic neural systems on the one hand, and either committed neural systems or bodily systems that are not part of the central neural systems on the other. So what, what uh, these authors, Mahler and Bunga, are saying is that you can still speak, you can still say that mental events, so if you think about something, if you want to do something, that you know your men, your, your brain, or the mental events that emerge from your brain can cause physical events in the same body. Okay? But that's not the same thing as saying that there is mind-matter interaction. I uh, concede that this is analytic philosophy, uh, you know, detailed conceptual analysis. And uh, I will not insist on that for this course. Uh, those who are interested in 
analytic philosophy of the mind can find here the solution of some problems. Uh, we do not need it for the uh, for the remainder of the of the class. Um, but to be to be complete, so what I mean is that you can have interaction between the neurons in uh, the prefrontal cortex, where you have the plastic send well this, the, the the plastic neurons which which do the higher cognitive tasks and which can command to your finger to point in this direction. Okay? That, that works. And someone can say, well, this is an example of mind-matter interaction. According to Manre and Bumi, this is a metaphorical way of talking. And they end with, by saying that, um, okay, well, let me continue reading, thus, there are interactions between sensory and motor areas, between ideational neural systems, neurons here which do the thinking, and external receptors. Yes, I can, for instance, feel that it's too hot and that I can do something with that information. There are interactions between cortical and immune systems, and so on. Because mental events are neural events, and because the causal relation is defined for pairs of events in concrete systems, we have a certain uh, corollary that mental events can cause non-mental events in the same body and vice versa. Consequently, disturbances of non-mental biofunctions may influence mental states and conversely, mental events such as acts of will may influence non-mental body states. This is what neurochemistry, neurology, psychiatry, psychosomatic medicine, psychoneuropharmacology, education and propaganda are all about. So what they mean with Bungemaner mean here with that is what propaganda is about. Well, in propaganda you learn something and then you act. Okay. But this is this is not important for the rest. I just wanted to give you an, an inch, an, an idea of what um, you can do in in biophilosophy. Um, so when we when we now uh, look again at the definition here of a conscious mental process conscious choice or conscious act, conceived as based on, governed by a mental process. Well, this is, according to their definition, a mental process and so on, that is monitored by some other mental activity in the same brain. As I said, there are, in, in other words, two different neural circuits involved. Okay? The, the gray ones are, for instance, uh, the neurons responsible for sensation, and the yellow ones, located in the front of the brain are, you know, uh, conceptual, cognitive, are responsible for the, for the uh, cognitive or conceptual, uh, you know, treatment of that uh, information. So this, by the way, this reminds us uh, of, what, of some of the theories on, on what are conscious mental states we've seen in the previous lesson. For instance, this anxious consciousness is very much related to that because according to this school of thought, uh, you know, conscious state should be accessible for being uh, treated, for being uh, processed, for instance, for, for speaking about it or for taking action. So you can easily relate these two theories. We might do that if you have time a little bit later. But simply put, for a mental process or act to be conscious, it must, must be thought about by a higher part of the brain. Is this clear? Or do you have any questions on that? Any questions? It's, it's nice to have questions, ladies and gentlemen. If it's not clear, it would be nice uh, that you told me. Julia, is this clear? And then you can, once you have defined what is a conscious act, or in general a conscious mental process, you can simply then also define what is consciousness, because you say, well, that's a collection of all the conscious states, 
of the brain of the animal in question, of which it is conscious, of which it is conscious. Okay? And to explain a little bit further, according to this convention, an animal can only be conscious of some of its own higher mental processes. It can feel, it can sense, and it can do things, but it can also think of what it perceives or thinks. In other words, an animal conscious of mental process X, for instance, you're thinking about something, for instance, how late is it and how long do we still have to stay here, uh, that is So, an animal conscious of a mental process X possibly undergoes, either in parallel or in quick succession, two different mental processes, so X itself, and which is the object mental process or content of its consciousness, and that is the other, the yellow circuit, which is doing the thinking about X. Okay, it has uh, being conscious about X. I think you have broadly understood the, the, the idea here. Uh, else tranquilly uh, reread uh, the slides or ask me now or later. Um, anyone? Any questions? No, then we can go on. So this leads then to this uh, definition that I've already uh, shown you. Okay, The action, or it could actually not only be an action, it could also be a thought or a perception, anything that goes on in the brain is conscious if it is monitored by some other mental activity in the brain of B. So this is what, what the model we, we have accepted. And needless to say, we have now to go on. And the big question for our research team has been for almost two years, how, by what means, is this monitoring happening? Okay, how does the brain monitor, which can mean to record, to analyze, to control, or to keep track of mental uh, activities. And mental activities can be having ideas, having uh, perceptions, so they feel something. How does the brain do that? What exactly does it mean? Okay. That is where we felt we could go further, and especially because we thought that this might connect us with computer science and eventually also with, with neuroscience. But I would like to, to make a little uh, intermezzo and first ask you something about intelligence. You know that uh, computers can, are pretty intelligent in some fields, right? There are some tasks that computers can do much better than we they can compute, uh, that can do arithmetic much faster, they can do even uh, certain tasks of higher mathematics much faster than us, they can, uh, you know, they're now capable of recognizing, for instance, uh, humors in, if you show them pictures of, let's say, uh, <clears throat> uh, some part of the body which might have a malfunction, for instance a tumor, they're already better than uh, many uh, uh, experts, medical experts, so they can be trained, this is uh, especially the, the, the strength of artificial intelligence, and I will say more on that in a moment. But what do you think is the main lacking thing? If you would speak in uh, abstract terms, okay? if, if you would want, if you would use only one word or three words, what would be the ideal thing that, you know, computers and artificial intelligence uh, should, should do to, to, to become really as intelligent as we on all fronts, or even more intelligent? What do you think that would be? You would say, well, that they should, they should be able to compute faster, but that is related to technological restrictions, okay? The, 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 the speed of a computer is linked to the size of the transistors in its CPU, and the smaller they are, the faster the electrons can move, and so the, smart, the faster it can calculate. So that is something which, which, which certainly has some limits, but where we could uh, go uh, further by technological means. I'm thinking here about, you know, uh, a um, concepts of, of, of philosophy, if you would, in an abstract way, want to characterize. Sophia, what do you think? 
any Sophia in the audience. Or here is Julia. Can we give her please a Well, as far as I remember, we were talking uh, about that intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, to be uh, more like uh, humane, it should have, it should be conscious. So maybe, uh, and uh, judging from uh, the definition that we have, maybe uh, computer uh, or artificial intelligence should be able to uh, monitor itself. Record, analyze, and control. That's a good uh, try, but let's see what the others say. Okay. Do you hear me? Uh -huh. I think uh, if we could monitor uh, somehow and uh, reproduce these uh, new impulse patterns, I think, that uh, should be collected to uh, reproduce our emotions uh, for AI, if it could be possible, yes. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I heard you. Do you mean that we should look at the neurobiology of the, of the brain and, see, of and then see how the neurons reproduce feelings and then implement that in? Yes. So, I so this gentleman here proposes, if I understand correctly, that uh, you know, computers should become, uh, should have emotions or should understand what are emotions. Is that correct? Correctly said. I feelings, feelings. Yes, it's all like overall <laughs> here. Uh, overall, talking about emotions, feelings. Yes, I think it's like that. And uh, I think all emotions, uh, when they're uh, going in our brains, uh, by neurons, by our neural connections. I think uh, they should have some pattern, uh, like this impulse should have some pattern for brain to understand to which emotion is it uh, one hundred percent, <laughs> and that should be implemented in a computer. Yes, to be like us. Okay, that's one thing. Yeah, we, we can agree on that. But uh, that you know, if you want to have a, a computer which is as let's say versatile as a human being, it might be useful to that it can feel, okay? it can have emotions. Uh, but I'm talking here about, you know, the cognitive things, intelligence, the dry stuff. Sophia? Sophia's are active today. I actually believe that the problem with uh, AI feeling emotions feeling emotions is not a problem, it's not an issue anymore because what is AI is just an algorithm that is being trained by humans and, is, and if we will train some AI better to recognize some kind of emotions and to reproduce them, then it will do it eventually. But I believe that uh, AI, it's, it's still difficult for AI to, re to recognize some metaphors some uh, underlying meanings and to produce them, them uh, by themselves because sometimes, for example, we can look at art object and we do not only see the visual side but also can think of, oh, what could be more under, like, under the interpretation of it. But I'm not sure if AI still uh, can do so and it seems that if we only could train it, then it wouldn't be as the human uh, interpretation as, 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 it, as it's in its possibility, you know? It's, if AI could actually uh, self-consciously start to interpret things and uh, think of different metaphors in some kind of object, uh, then maybe it could be closer to what our cognition, our intelligence is. Thank you, and uh, Najma, what do you think of it? Well, I would have to agree with Sophia. I think this can be one of the hard things about AI, um, is for them to kind of decipher the meaning that we, we can only decipher after we have gone through a lot of experience and understanding and like learning. and. This is unique to like each person, 
And so if we, like as she said, if we train a robot to do so, it's not gonna, I don't know, we cannot guarantee that they're going to uh, have results that can like decipher the meaning like we can, I guess, yeah. Okay, so meaning, I would summarize it in this way. Um, the computer should be able to give meaning to, to, for instance, art or to, in general, anything, right? Arseni? Anton, I will ask you afterwards, so be ready. Yes, to me, it's uh, all about, it is all about meaning because there are some sentences which computers at the moment cannot uh, process in a, uh, so, which they cannot make sense of, like, uh, the cup couldn't fit into the drawer because it was too big. To us it seems like an understandable sentence, but for computer it, it, doesn't, it doesn't understand the concept of size, and so, Absolutely, uh, yes. for computers to be intelligent, actually, we need them to be rational, and we, are, we as humans are more rational than we would like to admit, actually, so we are not that emotional, and I feel that to be intelligent in, in, in a human capacity, to human capacities, we have to be rational, we have to understand concepts and, mm. and some, uh, you know, uh, all the complexity of the things in the world. Mm -hmm. And is there one kind of keyword which would, you know, uh, explain the capacity to treat this complexity? Milana, do you have an idea? Um, microphone? microphone? I don't know, in one word, the conceptual thinking? Conceptual thinking, conceptual thinking, okay, okay. Or theories? <laughs> Did you read my article? <laughs> you showed this word on the screen. <laughs> we didn't uh, hear that, but okay. I think that's an excellent answer. So let us, let us, uh, so Milana, uh, and, and following the discussion before, comes to the conclusion that, you know, conceptual thinking is important and that theories play uh, a big role there. So, I think that we are indeed on the right track. And therefore, I would like that you think a few moments on what is a theory for you. Please think, what is for you a theory and explain it and give a few examples. I think your name is Anton? Mm -hmm. Yes, Anton. What is it? Can you give an example of theories? Still, I can't yet. Do you know no theory? I think no. Okay. Anyone else? It's impossible to, to do. Uh, and for acquiring knowledge, uh, are for you personally, are theories neutral, negative, or positive? So, as a, you know, a tool to, to, to reach knowledge, do you think a theory is positive, negative, or neutral? Milana? Like, uh, a theory seems like some structure of some structure that you can apply to new information. Mm -hmm. So it's like a prerequisite of you uh, building new knowledge inside your head. And it's like the concepts well defined that you can use, and the possible all the, all the possible relations or connections between them. So I think theory is uh, is what you it's what you actually use then you acquire new, new knowledge. When you acquire new knowledge, and when you when you analyze, for instance, uh, you know uh, data, when you are um, 
you would like to study, I think, cognitive neuroscience. Suppose that you, you are a researcher and you have people in your laboratory who are answering questions or you're scanning them with a machine and you're looking at the brain and you do you then use a theory or, or not? Um, yes, you use theory in a sense because you operate with concepts and you know what is possible, what is impossible. Mm -hmm. And to assume something, like to, to build a hypothesis, you also uh, need some basic knowledge, mm -hmm. some basic theory. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a very nice summary, Milano. And, and I fully agree with you. So, usually, you know, when you talk about these concepts of philosophy of science, the easiest way, at least for me, to, to look at things is to look at the natural science. Because they treat, they study the simplest systems, okay? They study dead bodies, dead or material, and, well, at least chemistry and physics. Uh, and so, in these fields, it's very simple. Anyone would agree that the highest form of knowledge are the theories. Okay, you can the only form of knowledge actually you have, especially in physics, is the, the, the knowledge of theories. All the knowledge uh, you know in physics is can be categorized in theories. Chemistry is largely like that, although there is a lot of classification going on there, which is you know which are not really theories, as I will define them in a moment. In biology, there is also a lot of classification going on. For instance, you know all these trees which says that, well, this species belongs to that uh, part of the branch. This can be considered to be a fish of this species, this one, however, of that. That's, that's not really, you can, you can also call that a form of theories. But in sociology, psychology, there are also theories, although they are much less certain. Okay, in physics, uh, people usually agree, okay, this is a good theory. At the same time, obviously, physicists very well realize that in 100 years, their theories will, be, will have changed, they will be more precise, and you know, old theories usually, after some time, they get uh, abandoned, and we, we, we go to better uh, theories. In sociology and psychology, uh, theories are highly debated because they treat you know, about very complex uh, systems, the human being. But you can also, you know, use the word theory in a very everyday sense, in a loose sense, in a mundane sense. For instance, you can have a theory of what was the cause of uh, the 9-11 attacks in America 20 years ago, or you can have a theory about why Italy won the football cup in um, this year. That's not really scientific theory, although it might have scientific ingredients. You might use some uh, psychological knowledge to explain one of these uh, examples here. Uh, but you know, actually, if you would try to define a theory, one of the key ingredients is that all theories are based on hypotheses. Okay, that's a key thing that uh, you know that all theories have in common, they are based on hypotheses or assumptions, that's another word. And except in mathematics, these hypotheses are, you know, with a fancy word, defeasible. They can be, in the course of uh, the evolution of, of, a, of a discipline, they can change, they can be upgraded or they can be rejected. But it's not just that theories are hypotheses, you cannot just throw any series of hypotheses in a theory, they should be logically interrelated. Okay, you should uh, be able of combining these hypotheses and by logic, and then deduce something from the statement which explains something or which predicts something. So this brings us to the following partial definition of, of uh, uh, theory. It is a set of logically interrelated hypotheses that can explain and predict certain facts or observations. You could say much more. And as I said, uh, theories, um, except in mathematics and logic, they do not have a status of, you know, the ultimate truth. Okay? They are defeasible, they are improvable, as I said before. But what is, what is good to remember 
is that in, in many disciplines, theories are considered to be the apex of knowledge. I think that you have understood by now what is the clue of this story. The clue is that I, we here in our team, we believe that uh, that would be the thing that computers would, would make really intelligence if they could understand and apply theories of as many disciplines as possible, as many fields of cognition, of knowledge as possible. For instance, if you want to build a computer or a robot which is ethical, then, as Vitali had said, you need, you know, to, it, it need to, to master ethical principles or ethical hypotheses and in the ideal sense, uh, in the ideal case, ethical theories even if it's not so easy to say what would be uh, the, the relevant uh, theory, but that's another thing. We're talking here about the principles. To give you one example of a, of a very well-known and, and still quite accepted theory, that's Newton's theory of mechanics, which actually is condensed in four laws. Okay? And by these four laws, you can explain all of classical mechanics. So you see here four hypotheses which are logically interrelated and you can explain with these four principles how an apple falls, how fast it falls, when it will reach the ground. You can predict and explain how rockets will move if you know the force. By the way, these, force, these four uh, principles or laws here, probably you remember them. The first says that, let's say, law of inertia, the velocity of an object remains constant unless there is a force F working on it. The force F is related to the acceleration A by a simple uh, concept of proportionality, which is the mass, which, which is Newton's famous uh, second law, the law of motion. The third law is super simple too, actually. Action force is equal to reaction force. And you can add, if you like, these are the, the three most important laws, but Newton also gave us the, the mathematical expression when the force is of a special type, namely of the gravitational type. So with, with that law you can also, for instance, well if you uh, know the expression of gravity, you can also explain all the movement of the planets. Okay. To very good approximation, only Einstein uh, has found a way to make them a little bit more precise, which becomes important for very fast moving objects or very heavy objects. So this example, this is, you know, uh, physicists would call this a paradigmatic example of a theory because it is very powerful. You can deal with all kinds of varied uh, phenomena from all kinds of nature. As soon as there is movement involved, you use these laws here and you only need four hypotheses to, to deal with. So in the work that we developed, we proposed that actually the monitoring, okay, now I, I come back to my theory of what is uh, conscious uh, thought or choice or, uh, or, or perception. We believe that um, this monitoring always involves some assumptions, some beliefs, some reasons, or in an intellectually complex context, theories. I will give you examples and then we'll do a few minutes of pause to let these ideas sink in. For instance, so we believe that you know, in any conscious act, you monitor through hypothesis, beliefs, reasons, or in a, in a general case, theories. Okay? For instance, when you freely or consciously decide which clothes you are going to wear for the party tonight or for going to the university, you may be in the belief or use the belief that this suit here is better for today's task than, than another one. Or another example is when you freely or consciously choose whether to help your neighbor. Well, you know, you might be thinking, ah, my dear neighbor, you know, I will help him because I'm sure he will offer me a beer afterwards. And, you know, he's a cool dude. Let's do that. So you, 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 you base your decision, you monitor your choice by making some hypothesis, by you know, using some data in your memory, 
you know, in, in, in a general terms, you use some hypothesis, beliefs. And if the context is complex, you might have to use real uh, intellectual or scientific theories. For instance, when the captain of a spaceship, uh, you know, is seeing a meteor coming at high speed to him, then he has to make a very quick so-called free or conscious decision. And he might need to use here a serious theory of mechanics, you know, to make the right decision. Okay. 50 megawatt to the left or 1,000 megawatt to the right, how I'm going to, you know, to escape from the meteor, he might need to use uh, some serious theory. And if you yourself are making complex decisions, for instance, what you're going to do with uh, the complicated person you are living together with, then you might need to use some psychological theories or some sociological theories and so on and so forth. As I already gave this example, even when you're making, you're aware, you're conscious about something super simple, for instance, a dog bites you, you could say, well, even then, when you're aware that the dog bites you, you're using the hypothesis that it is a dog and not a wolf. Okay, so there is a little bit in any form of consciousness, we believe here in our research team, you know, you, you, there is here in, no, there is here in the scheme, well, I'm sorry, I don't see it here anymore. Let's, there is a scheme where you know that, are, that you saw before, where you have these yellow neurons which get connected to the, to the, let's say the object neurons, those you know, you're thinking about. Um, and so, in other words, you, you, this monitoring involves this, um, these assumptions, hypothesis, or theory. Uh, and that's how the monitoring is done. Okay. And we introduce here a little definition we call theory star is an umbrella concept, a general concept, which, uh, you know, connects or which, is, which simply denotes any of these other concepts here, such as assumption, belief, reason, and scientific theory. We call that a theory star. We do that because, you know, this makes the thing simple. In, in three words, you can say something is conscious if, well, something becomes conscious through monitoring through theories with a star. And that, there is the origin of this word, CMT, model of consciousness, okay? So, explicitly, we simply add here to Bunge's um, definition that the monitoring occurs through beliefs, hypotheses, reasons, and in general, theories with a star. So we have introduced this new, this new concept, here. concept here. Why do we do, why do, we do that? Because it, Think that we can that we can you know, connect now with artificial intelligence, intelligence at some, some, some point with uh, neuroscience. Uh, neuroscience. And that's and what that's I will explain, what I will explain you in the main the main of, of this of lecture. This lecture. Um, um, so in so, so in so to the CMT, to the CMT model, model, consciousness, model, consciousness, even act, even act conscious, 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 for instance, when, for instance, it's, not when it's, it's not triggered, triggered, by, triggered by, by reflexes, by reflexes or by feeling, or for fear, for instance. Well, as well, sure, as sure, sure mm -hmm. if an act is if conscious, an act is one monitors or monitors with reference, with reference to or within theory stuff. Theory stuff. Of course, this is, course, this is you know, the whole, whole, the whole uh, uh, list of different, of different theories of consciousness in the last lecture. This, this is, this is on, the right, on the rational side. Okay. This is not this is not theory, of, theory of uh, phenomenal consciousness, consciousness, consciousness or dislike consciousness or quality of consciousness, consciousness which is you remember, you remember related, related to, um, to, um, to feelings. To feelings. Okay. Okay. Uh, we are talking, uh, we are about, talking here about rational, rational or cognitive, cognitive consciousness. Uh, consciousness. Why? Because, why? Because that is that is type of consciousness that we might most be able, to be able, be able to implement in computers, in computers and artificial, and artificial intelligence. intelligence. And that is that is what, I, what will I will uh, uh, 
Está aprobado, está aprobado. In the rest of the, the rest of the time, time, let us please continue here uh, in uh, five in minutes. Five minutes. minutes. Okay. So, in 28. So, if you want to convince the community that you know there is something interesting in this idea, the first task you have to do is to compare it to other theories of consciousness. And ideally, you should be able to solve problems that these uh, theories have by your new model. Okay, that is how in analytic philosophy you can convince the community. I will not do that here, it's not important for us. Uh, that's why I put this big gray um, square there. So the students do not need to know this. If they're interested, they can read it because some of them have seen, studied these other theories in another course. And we explain in the articles how exactly uh, you know, our model can solve uh, problems of these other uh, theories. So we have a relative confidence in uh, the model. Do you have any questions on that by any chance? Okay. If not, then now I'm quickly going to say something about the connection with artificial intelligence. Okay. And here we go. So, uh, let us quickly look at, you know, what are the most advanced, some of the most advanced things that artificial intelligence can do. And of course we have in the back of our mind the question, can, is there a chance that robots based on artificial intelligence uh, can become conscious one day? This research done with Vitaly Nikolaev, with Alexei Melnikov from the Russian Academy of Science and Itmo University, and we started working with Henry Shevlin from Cambridge University. First, a short introduction of how artificial neural nets uh, learn. Anyone uh, knows? Are there computer scientists here or IT people? Unfortunately, we don't have that much time with, with the people uh, uh, who are in the, in the class here. We can maybe on, on Friday look a little bit deeper here. For those who are visitors, I will very quickly say maybe uh, something useful about it that you can use. Uh, you know that neurons exist, you know that they work by connecting and that there are signals transmitted between these biological neurons. Well, an artificial neural net is a computer program which can be schematized or metaphorically understood as, you know, a connection of layers and which, which communicate with each other via mathematical rules. So uh, an artificial neural net is not, you know, not, are not physical dots put in layers and uh, connected with bars. Well, this is just a drawing of, you know, what the computer program is doing. And it somehow, uh, you know, in an actually pretty simple way, it mimics a little bit what neurons do. Everyone, what real neurons, biological neurons do. Everyone agrees that these artificial neural nets are much simpler than the real neurons. What our neurons can do is much more complicated. At least for the moment. So, you can, for instance, uh, in the input layer, you can, in your computer program, uh, you, the, 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 the computer scientist, he can show uh, a picture of an apple by digitalizing the photo and by, you know, simply feeding into the neurons, the artificial neurons in the left input layer, all these data. And the artificial neural net can be trained to say yes or no, one or zero, yes means yes, this is an apple, or zero, no, this is not an apple. That's an example of where artificial neural nets are super good at. They can classify. That's, by the way, essentially the only thing uh, they are good at at the moment. Okay? Uh, so there are simple mathematical rules how uh, you should do that. We are not going to see this uh, in this lecture. There will be other lectures and maybe um, Alexei Lysenko will tell you more about that. The math is simple. And 
who can give an example of where artificial neural nets or artificial intelligence is already used nowadays? They are, for instance, used to to um, to if you if you write a handwritten number, uh, the the neural net can well if this thing you draw is scanned, digitalized, and fed into uh, the artificial neural net, the artificial intelligence system, it can tell you which number it is. That's an example for what is used. It can classify, for instance, it can distinguish peers from apples or cats from dogs. It can, it is used, for instance, for security reasons. It can, uh, you know, cameras can scan people in an airport and can recognize, okay, this individual here has been filed by uh, the Russian Secret Service and is a, is a, is a dangerous individual we have to track him. Okay? So recognizing things, which is a form of classification, that uh, is what they are good at for the moment. Um, they have done some, some more sur surprising things. So one of the uh, most surprising things is that some computer based on AI has beaten the best Go player uh, in the world. Go is considered to be an even more complex game as chess. So a few years ago, when this was announced that one uh, computer could beat the best human uh, Go player, that was uh, a big achievement for artificial intelligence. But to summarize, this is not yet highly abstract, theory-based thinking or learning. Okay? Uh, this is this classification. Certain tasks that a child can learn in two minutes, for instance, a child can pretty quickly learn whether when you put three or four blocks of wood on top of each other, whether the fourth one which it put, the child puts on it, well it, whether it will make the whole tower fall, a child you know, very quickly learns, okay, I have to place these blocks in a certain way, uh, so that the whole flower is not falling. An artificial neural net needs enormous amount of time you, and, and a computer scientist needs to train. Training means here, give examples. So, uh, a computer scientist, a human being, needs for all these neural nets to give thousands, sometimes millions or more, billions of examples, and then, by mimicking, by imitation, uh, the neural net begins to learn by a mathematical procedure, actually, which is actually pretty simple to, to understand. So what is now? Are computer scientists going any further? Can we come close to theory-based or hypothesis-based thinking? I think that one of the, the most advanced uh, results here uh, has been achieved two years ago by uh, people in, in Boston, so from MIT, uh, they published a paper in a physics journal toward an artificial intelligence physicist for unsupervised learning. Short word of, about the author. Uh, the, the authors are certain Tylen Wu and Max Tegmark. Max Tegmark is a, is a very famous physicist, cosmologist, and AI scientist. He, he wrote a book on, you know, the, the impact that artificial intelligence probably will have soon on our society. He is one of the people who, who believes that artificial intelligence will have a, a big impact, that we can do great things with it if we make it more intelligent than it is now. He also is, if I remember correctly, one of those who also warns for the negative aspects of uh, artificial intelligence. So, you know, there are people who are predicting that at some point, and not so far from now, there will be a so-called singularity when uh, artificial intelligence systems will become, will outsmart humans, and which, and they can be, they, they might even, you know, uh, overrule us and um, install uh, the, the, the reign of the artificial intelligence systems. Um, okay, so he has written a lot on uh, on artificial intelligence, and in this article, they describe actually the following thing. They describe 
how artificial neural nets, if you feed them with data which describe simple physical systems, for instance, a stone that is falling, you, uh, you know, you give the positions of the stone as a function of time, that's a discrete series of data, you feed it into the, into the computer, into the artificial uh, neural net, it can say, okay, this is a falling stone which has a speed of, or an acceleration of 10 meters per second per second, and it will reach, well, it will be, it can predict the future of the stone, okay? It can predict in five seconds it will be there. It can do that with a few simple physical situations. And also, uh, it needs to be trained, the artificial neural network, the computer needs to be trained by a real physicist, by very many examples, okay? By many examples of falling stones. The interesting thing, and they describe in the article how they do it, as for computer scientists, and in a little bit more detail what it can do, is that this artificial neural net, which was called AI physicist by Wim Degmar, it learns to recognize trajectories of objects, such as stones, that are governed by actually simple equations uh, describing electric, electrical force and gravitational force, uh, and, and two other simple cases of physical environment. So, they describe how they do it. In, all, in other words, this, this artificial uh, neural net learns to recognize a small number of physical environments, in this case, laws actually, and to predict the evolution of the system. And the computational strategies used are a little bit similar, if you like, in a metaphorical way, to those that are used by real scientists, such as, for instance, unification or simplification. But that's a detail for us now. What is interesting is that the, the authors state that the ultimate goal of this program is that they hope that they can in the future one day enable AI to help us discover entirely novel physical theories from data. So here is a word that I would like to hear, which is that of theory. Some people are beginning to, you know, to work on computers that can discover theories and use theories to interpret data and to guide, uh, you know, what the computer is going uh, to do with uh, the data by using the theories. Uh, this is our collaborator, Alexei Melnikov. I will only say that he is very famous in the quantum physics community since a few years because he trained a computer to devise itself new, interesting quantum experiments. That's, uh, that's a nice achievement. I'm just telling you this for um, just sort of fun of it. Let me now uh, conclude the lecture of today. What might this teach us about the future of artificial intelligence and of the possibility to have uh, conscious computers one day? Our model says that well, consciousness in an essential ingredient, or one of the essential ingredients is that uh, consciousness demands that the agent can monitor its acts through cognitive frameworks, which we dubbed theories with the stars, which can be rules, hypotheses, reasons, beliefs. Is there hope for conscious robots and AI systems according to this model? Well, we just there are computer scientists working on uh, artificial intelligence that, that can discover and use such theories, okay? And if indeed these neural nets would be able to do that, then according to the CMT model, they would possess a key ingredient of rational uh, consciousness. What you are studying is, are they really mastering theories? Okay? Is that really true? And you know that's debatable. Um, Actually, if you look a little bit in the details, uh, the theories, both the monitoring and the theories, are still in its, in its infancy. The monitoring is at least initially done by, by human beings, because we need to train the, 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 the systems by feeding them with, with examples and by indicating which outcomes in these examples are correct. For instance, uh, well, I will not say more uh, on that. 
And what is, what is, what is most important, namely, these computers do not yet really discover theories. Okay? Actually, what they do, they can, um, they can discover or they can use laws, some specific laws. I mentioned the law of gravity, the law of, uh, of the electrical interactions, so of law, um, and, and, and one or two more. Okay? That is far away from understanding and using and discovering the theory of Newton. That is a real theory. Okay? I, I reminded you that it's based on four logically interrelated uh, hypotheses. So with this whole theory, you can deal and understand and relate all the mechanical phenomena. Every time when there's motion involved, you can use a theory. So these artificial neural nets are very far from the intelligence of a new, uh, of a Newton or of a physicist who knows Newton's theory, who is much more versatile, who can understand incomparably more context and environment than uh, the best artificial neural nets that we have at our disposal for the moment. Okay? So actually, theory mastery is not, it seems, uh, there yet. But you know, laws are uh, essential ingredients of theories. Okay? Laws are hypotheses which, you know, can be called the basis of a theory. And actually, so the theories and all the words are still super simple. For the moment, they are just laws. And artificial neural nets are far from recognizing, let alone reconstructing, for instance, the whole theory of Newton. We are still very far from the level of abstraction of which the human mind is capable. You can say the same thing in other words by saying that the ANN is specialized on a tiny part of all the data that a human being can encounter in the real world or, or future robot. And of course, such artificial neural nets cannot analyze the data that we as human beings encounter on, on a daily basis. We are confronted every day with other people. We are in social context. We are in psychological context. And, well, according to the CMT model, if a robot or an artificial intelligence system would really be conscious, would really be really intelligent, then it needs some conceptual frameworks, some models, some theories, also for this very complicated context. In a way, physical contexts are much more simple. You know, you usually have theories uh, for physical context. And for these contexts, uh, physicists and computer scientists are on the track to <coughs> make robots or computers which can, you know, uh, analyze these physical data through the lens of theories. But for, uh, you know, the, the context that are flexible, uh, robot, an all-round robot, or an all-round artificial intelligence system, uh, which would need to deal with. Well, that's we're far from from uh, mass. We're far from you know building systems that can deal with these much more complex uh, contexts. And the question remains: Are there theories for social interaction? Are there theories for psychological behavior? I tend to say yes. We are far from having built the full-blown theories because the systems are complex. But uh, from the point of view of philosophy of science, one would say, well, any form of knowledge must be based on some uh, rules, hypotheses. In sociology, you have a tendency, right? You have uh, law-like statements such as a law, um, human groups have, to follow, have the tendency to follow the leader. That's maybe not as, an, as exact law as, uh, you know, the law of gravity. It's not a numerical law. It's, it has not the same precision, but it may still apply almost all the time. So this, this is an example of an ingredient that could be part of a social theory. And the CMT model says, well, if these robots really want to be, you know, good uh, and natural social 
beings if they really want to behave in a uh, clever way in a social context, well, they will have to, they will need to master uh, social theories with the star at least. Okay. And um, we have one project in the pipeline to see if we can um, have ethical theories which can be codified, okay? Because um, ethics of artificial intelligence is a is a very hot topic. So that's another example of, of really fascinating research that um, that can be done, and with some well, we hope to to uh, engage in that research. I think I will that we are almost uh, ready. So. <clears throat> How much time do we still have? Okay, we are actually there, so let me end, let me maybe uh, just end with two more slides. Um, not only need these artificial intelligence systems to master theories with a star or to simply put theories, social theories, psychological, physical, but they need to have some kind of a hierarchy between these theories, that these theories need to be linked in a coherent uh, web, okay? But, because for instance, they need to be, you can call it maybe a CPU or some central decision organ in the computational structure that says that, uh, well, um, with this human being, you should not to interesting physics experiment using the physics theory, but you should behave ethically according to this and this social norms, for instance. Okay? So there must be a connection, a co coherency between the different theories. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen, for today. Um, the CMT model says that the essence of consciousness is a capacity to see the world through theories with a star. And some of the most advanced research in AI precisely searches for automated theory discovery for the moment only in physics. But maybe this is, you know, the, the beginning of, a, of, of conscious uh, robots. If you would ask me, do you think that in X years, X can be anything, 5 years, 50 years, or 500 years, do you think that there will be conscious robots in the sense of the CMT would and my answer is I would guess yes because there are hundreds of thousands of computer scientists involved in this research on the other hand at the same time I say that the challenge is huge okay we are very far from theory mastery automated theory mastery by artificial intelligence and the deeper reason is that there is no theory for theory building. Okay? No one knows how do we, we, as you have seen, these physicists have already you know, started uh, making a computer scores which can extract laws from uh, physical data. Maybe at some point they will be able to deduce ethical laws from human behavior, from data about human behavior, or social laws from uh, you know, observing uh, human beings in a social context, but that is not yet a theory. Laws are in key ingredients of a theory, but you need to go further. Okay? And the problem is, no one knows how to do that. There's no theory for theory. Building. Any questions? I think that all those who wish to go home, please, you may, but uh, maybe some of you have questions. So this is not the consciousness of feeling, right? Feeling is, and emotions are more complex. I'm talking here about uh, rational or cognitive consciousness. You know, there are science fiction writers who, like Jules Verne, and many of the things I predicted, even if the people at that time could not believe it, they, they happened. By the way, this is one more reason to understand how artificial intelligence works, so that we, you know, will not uh, fall into this uh, worst case scenario where artificial intelligence systems will master us, right, and will become the rulers of the world. So that's one more reason that, you know, 
I personally, I'm, I'm not a, uh, you know, a technology uh, 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 fanatic. I'm not waiting for the day that robots will, will, will behave consciously or, uh, you know, as human beings. Um, but what I think is important for all of us to, to understand what some people are building, okay, and how they do it, and how we could, as um, human social scientists, contribute to, to, uh, to maybe regu regulate it or to give ideas on, on how to make ethical AI and so on. What do you think of it, I think that rationality is actually uh, only part of making a conscious, and a conscious artificial intelligence. I think that robots have, have to also be sort of curious. They want to make theories. They have to be motivated as we are humans. Uh, motivated because we are hardwired to actually be curious and be interested in stuff. And in this regard, I think that it may be uh, possible to create a, a curious artificial intelligence, but I do think that we will do that because, you know, uh, scientists from the Middle Ages dreamt of creating something that would uh, turn metals into gold, but they didn't succeed, and there are no such enterprises. At, at this moment, so I don't think I think that the same ha will happen to projects of art, of true artificial intelligence. Actually, that's an interesting thought. Maybe we'll end here. Or Milana, do you want to add something or to ask something? Okay, then have a nice evening and see you for the next lecture. <laughs>